Welcome to Chapter 5, Part 3, Microbial Metabolism. In this section, we're going to be covering photosynthesis, metabolic diversity, biosynthesis, and integration of metabolism. In photosynthesis, we're going to be talking about the two different parts, light-dependent reactions and light-independent reactions. Light-independent reactions are also called carbon fixation reactions. Before we start talking about photosynthesis, first let's talk about the forest before we get confused in all of the tangle of the underbrush. Yeah, it's a bad joke, but it's appropriate for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the most basic of anabolic processes, the most basic of processes where we're putting together smaller molecules to make bigger molecules. And what's happening with photosynthesis is we're taking energy from the sun, we're taking energy from light, and we're converting it to chemical energy that the cell can store for later use. Now, you as an animal cannot take light energy and use it to make sugars. We just can't do it. And unless you're a photosynthetic organism, you can't do it either. All of life on Earth is dependent upon photosynthesis. So understanding photosynthesis and how it aids in the greater life process um, of the biosphere of Earth um, is an important thing. Now on to the underbrush. Photosynthesis is divided into two different types of metabolic pathways, the light dependent reactions and the light independent reactions. This is kind of like the difference between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. Glycolysis and the Krebs cycle work together to generate ATP through the breakdown of sugar, but they're two separate processes. The cell can use either one or the other depending upon its needs. Photosynthesis is similar. There's two different sets of reactions that the plant or the photosynthetic bacteria can use independently depending upon what its needs are. So let's talk about the light dependent reactions first. What happens is light comes in and hits chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a molecule that when you look at it, it looks similar to hemoglobin. There's magnesium in the center and the light excites an electron of the magnesium and that generates energy. That electron is removed from the chlorophyll and it's passed through an electron transport chain. So this is like what's happening in mitochondria. Enzymes of the electron transport chain take the electron, pass it from enzyme complex to enzyme complex. In the meantime, hydrogens are pushed to the other side of a membrane. This is sounding familiar, isn't it? In the process of which, okay, when those hydrogens want to come back to the other side of the membrane, we have, guess what, ATP synthase. We open a hole, the protons come through, we've got a little turbine down here just like we do in mitochondria. Um, a inorganic phosphate is attached to ADP and you make ATP. Okay. Now just like in mitochondria with its electron transport chain, you, that terminal electron has to be gotten rid of. So NADP plus, it's like NAD plus in um, the Krebs cycle and in acetyl-CoA formation and in glycolysis, except for this one has an extra phosphate, so think P for plant. So on a test, if you see NADP plus, you know it's involved in photosynthesis. Okay, so NADP plus comes in, picks up that worn out electron. Now because it's got an extra a negative charge um, it, it also attracts a proton becoming NADPH. Now just like NADH is more energetic than NAD+, NADPH is more energetic than NADP+, and it can be used in other reactions. Now this process of using light to generate ATP is called photophosphorylation. We're using light or photo to phosphorylate ATP. Now let's talk about 
how we get an electron back to chlorophyll because once that magnesium and chlorophyll has lost an electron to the electron transport chain it hangs on to the rest of its electrons really really tight it now has a positive charge it's not going to let any more electrons go so we have to replace that electron so that more light can come in excuse me the light can come in and the electron can be excited by the light and be sent through the electron transport chain well it gets it from water okay down here we've got a water chlorophyll grabs that water and just splits it into three parts spits out um, two protons and oxygen gets spat out now it's all by itself and it hang gets with another oxygen and becomes atmospheric oxygen and the two electrons that were taken from the hydrogens go to replace the electrons around the magnesium now you've all heard that plants release oxygen this is how they do it this is where we get atmospheric oxygen from um, they've done studies paleontological studies and they've found from looking at the rocks actually it would be geology that originally the Earth's atmosphere didn't have a whole lot of free oxygen we can tell this because at a certain time period we start seeing a lot of rusting of iron and because of this we know that there's a lot of free oxygen because that's what causes iron to rust well where did this oxygen come from well about the same time we start seeing evidence of photosynthetic prokaryotes so if it wasn't for the photosynthetic prokaryotes we wouldn't have the oxygen that we need to breathe there would be no electron transport chain in mitochondria and we wouldn't be living at the high metabolic rate that we currently do now the chloroplasts and plants that engage in photosynthesis remember they're descended from cyanobacteria which are related we believe to these original photosynthetic bacteria aren't we glad for these photosynthetic bacteria aren't we glad for cyanobacteria let's talk about the next set of metabolic reactions in photosynthesis the light independent reactions it's also called the Calvin Benson cycle or carbon fixation this is where all of that ATP and NADPH that's generated by the light dependent reactions gets used up and we use it making sugar using the stored energy of light now the light energy is stored in ATP so let's take a look at the Calvin Benson cycle we start out with um, rubulose diphosphate it is a five carbon molecule that has a phosphate on each end then we take CO2 that has one carbon and we attach it to the rubulose diphosphate this creates a, a very unstable six carbon in intermediate that immediately breaks down into two three carbon molecules with a phosphate on each end and doesn't this look familiar this looks like something from glycolysis doesn't it in fact from here on out it's gonna look like we're running glycolysis backwards so to run glycolysis backwards it's gonna take energy because these are endogonic reactions so ATP that's been generated by the light dependent reactions goes in and we also need the energy from NADPH it goes in and we make G3P you remember that from glycolysis there's a reason why I mentioned G3P well you notice that there's you know sixes off to the side here I'm not gonna make you remember that just remember that some of the G3P gets funneled off and we use it to make glucose and other sugars and then we animals come along and eat the plants and we get our glucose from there but some of the glyceraldehyde 3 phosphates get regenerated into ribulose uh, diphosphate and we need more ATPs from this okay and so the cycle goes around and around and around in the way of it being a cycle it's similar to the Krebs cycle what we start out with is what we end up with but we're also putting in CO2 attaching it to a carbon backbone and we use that to make other molecules I've used glucose as this example but you can take glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate and you can make amino acids out of it and all sorts of good stuff okay so light is not directly involved in this but if the lights not shining 
you can't run the Calvin Benson cycle because you run out of ATP. It's kind of like if the power goes out and I happen to have an electric stove, I'm not going to cook much because my stove is cold. <laughs> so it's a similar type of thing. So even though these are light independent reactions, they're being fueled by the light dependent reactions that generates all this ATP and NADPH. Now that we've been wandering in the trackless jungle of met metabolism, let's fight our way free of the forest and take a look at the entire forest again. Let's go ahead and uh, from here on out, we're going to take everything we've learned about catabolic reactions, the reactions where we break down molecules to make um, energy, and anabolic reactions where we build up molecules to store energy and we're going to look at how organisms, all life, use these depending upon what enzymes they have. And this is called metabolic diversity. Okay, All organisms have to have an energy source. They have to get energy from someplace. So let's talk about the organisms we're familiar with. Those that use chemical energy to get their chemicals to get their energy. We call them chemotrophs. Chemo for chemical, trophs for eating. Okay, So they get their carbons also from chemicals. In other words, they don't get it from CO2. So organic compounds provide energy Okay. And they also provide their carbon, and we call them chemoheterotrophs. You are a chemoheterotroph. The E. coli in your gut are chemoheterotrophs. So that means that you have to eat chemicals to get your energy and to get your organic molecules. Now let's talk about plants and cyanobacteria. These are organisms that use light for their energy. They are phototrophs. They are light eaters. Okay. And they get their carbon from CO, CO2. So that makes them photoautotrophs, auto for self. So plants and cyanobacteria are completely independent of all other life. They don't have to eat other organisms to get their energy, and they don't have to eat other organisms to get their carbon molecules. So they sit in the sun. They bring in light energy, they make their own sugars. They store those sugars and they use those sugars to fuel their own metabolism. Remember that plants also have mitochondria and cyanobacteria and other photosynthetic bacteria have electron transport chains like in mitochondria that produce ATP from chemical energy when the light's not shining. They're completely independent. Over here with chemoheterotrophs, we are dependent upon the photoautotrophs because we don't have the enzymes to either get energy from light or to make our own carbon molecules, our own organic molecules from CO2. So we're dependent upon the photoautotrophs. Somewhere along the line, there have been mutations so that we don't have those enzymes anymore and we become predators. You didn't think of yourself as strictly a predator. If you eat just plants, we call you a herbivore, but you're still living off of other life. Now, there's two other groups that they're weird, but we're going to talk about them just briefly. Okay, here are the organisms that use chemical energy, okay, for their energy source. They're not photosynthetic, but they are able to fix CO2. They have a Calvin Benson type reaction. So they can make their own organic molecules. We call them chemoautotrophs. Only bacteria do this. Well, and some archaea as well. Now, over here, there are some organisms that get their energy from light, but they have to eat other organisms to get their organic molecules. We call them photoheterotrophs. These are also just bacteria and archaea. These are the weird guys. They're not what you're familiar thinking about. But it makes life interesting. Now we're going to talk about biosynthesis other than that found in photosynthesis. We're going to talk about how even heterotrophs can make their own polysaccharides, lipids, amino acids, purines, and pyrimidines. Now remember when we talked about the Calvin Benson cycle, how I talked about glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate, and that's actually found down here. We can take that and we can run it backwards to make glucose in plants. Let's talk about what happens in heterotrophs. 
So the storage molecule in bacteria and animals is glycogen. Okay, it's similar to starch that you find in plants, but it's more branched. And we take some of the metabolic byproducts of glycolysis and we pull them out earlier. Now we have to take ATP and uracil triphosphate, which is a cousin of ATP, and we use that to run these exergonic anabolic reactions to make glycogen. Now we can take fructose 6-phosphate, if you're a bacterium, and we can run that um, through anabolic pathways to make peptidoglycan. You remember what peptidoglycan is used for in bacteria? That's right, cell walls. We can do a similar thing with lipids. We can take glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, we can convert it to uh, DHAP, and we can make glycerol. We can take acetyl-CoA, join it together through anabolic processes to make fatty acids, join the glycerol with the fatty acid to make simple lipids. Then you can go through other anabolic processes to make phospholipids, steroids, and different things. The whole point of this is, even though you can get energy from these processes, we're also getting what are called metabolic intermediates that we can use in anabolic reactions. It's similar with amino acids. You can take products from the Krebs cycle, okay, and you can make amino acids. You can take an amino acid that you have an awful lot of, but I need some more of these. And I can take the amine group, move it over to another molecule, and make another amino acid out of it. We're moving things around constantly. It depends upon the needs of the cell. The biochemistry of the cell is not static. We can do the same thing for nucleic acids. Now purines and pyrimidines, those are the two basic groups of nucleotides. And we can take these um, intermediates and we can make all sorts of stuff out of it. You'll notice that for nucleic acids it's much more complicated. So let's talk about metabolism in general. We've talked about glycolysis where we take glucose and we generate ATP. Okay, and we can go down and we can go through acetyl-CoA formation, we can go through the Krebs cycle, create more ATP, more NADH, more FADH2, and we can shunt that off into the electron transport chain, make more energy. In the meantime, what are we using that energy for? We're taking some of these intermediates when we have plenty of energy and we shunt them off to make carbohydrates, various carbohydrates. We can shunt them off to make amino acids, can shunt them off to make fatty acids and other lipids here where we can get some of our intermediates for amino acids. All of this is going on constantly within your cells, within bacterial cells. Anabolic reactions are not separate from catabolic reactions. They're all going on at the same time. It depends upon what the needs of the cells are. If the cell needs more energy, you're going to be doing more catabolic reactions. If you have plenty of energy, then you're going to be building up the cell. The cell is making its own carbohydrates, it's making its own amino acids, it's making its own nucleotides and lipids, it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it divides. It reproduces when times are good. When times are bad, it scales back, it uses more energy, and it's not reproducing as much. All of this goes together. Okay, you've probably felt like I have flipped your brain inside out, but just think of all the glucose your brain is using, generating all of those neural connections so you can remember all of this stuff. Okay, this is what I want you to remember in the summary portion. These are some good charts that I have for learning Chapter 5 Metabolism. And believe it or not, we're going to be using some of this information later on when we talk about growing microbes in the lab. You have to understand their metabolic pathways so you can understand what to feed them. We're also going to be using it when we talk about inhibiting growth of microorganisms. You don't want your microbes getting to your food before we do. We're very jealous of our food. So, do not despair and Go over this as many times as you need, and also take the Troublesome Topics survey. Let me know what parts you want me to go over again in lecture.